Hi there. Uh, if you don't know who I am at this point, it worries me. Anyways, here I am back with segment eight of the viruses. And in this section, I'm going to talk about uh, the Rhabdoviridae and also Retroviridae. And then in the last segment, I will discuss um, some of the viruses that cause hepatitis. All right, so take a look at your outline. And there is a picture of a rabid dog. That's a bit scary. And also um, a little diagram of uh, the rabies virus. Now, um, this virus is a species in the genus known as Lysivirus. Um, and these are, in this uh, genus, these viruses are bullet-shaped. They have an envelope. There are spikes on that envelope. And of course, those spikes aid in the infection process. Now, um, What's interesting about, and let's go ahead and talk about rabies virus specifically. Actually, let me just make one statement before I get into that more specific discussion. There are a number of other viruses in this genus that cause a variety of neurological diseases, such as um, there's one uh, disease called Australian bat disease. It's a rabies-like infection. All right, now, uh, rabies virus can infect um, any species of uh, warm-blooded animal. I've read that it can also... Um, in fact, um, uh, let's say uh, like um, lizards, snakes, reptiles, and I even have read in a few places, but I, I just couldn't find anything to follow up on that, that plants can even serve as a host. Uh, the only significant hosts are going to be warm-blooded animals. Um, all right, now there are three reasons why human cases of rabies are extremely rare in the United States. Um, first one is that as a society we're pretty good, we sure could be better, but we're pretty good about vaccinating our pets for rabies. That's that's quite important. And um, there are some areas, some uh, let's call them hot spots, throughout the United States where the number of cases of rabies in wild populations is higher than average. And so in those areas, what public health officials do is um, they take, um, there is um, an injected form of the rabies vaccine. That's the most effective vaccine, but there's also an oral version of the vaccine. Not as effective as the injected version, uh, but it still it's better than nothing. So. In those areas where uh, we have a higher than usual incidence of rabies in wild populations, what they will do is, is they'll take this oral vaccine, they'll put it on um, a, um, a food that's palatable to a lot of different species of animals, and they'll, they'll just you know, put that out in, um, in the forest. Uh, the animals will come and they'll eat some of this. And this is most definitely not a perfect uh, solution because some animals aren't going to get any and some maybe get more than they need and others maybe not quite enough, but it has helped. It's contributed to um, a lessening of the number of uh, cases of human rabies in the United States. The third reason why rabies is so rare in developed nations, the United States specifically, is uh, due to a program called either PET, that stands for post-exposure treatment, or they sometimes call it PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. And this is a situation where if a human is even um, possibly, uh, has even possibly been exposed to the virus, they are going to undergo um, a vaccination series for the rabies virus. One of the things that's interesting is, I think that um, w without me even telling you, you would, um, you would have figured out or you would have guessed anyways that most vaccines are only going to be effective if they're given prior to the exposure, right? Well, there is um, an incubation period after exposure to the virus, more on that in a few minutes, in which uh, if in that window the person was vaccinated, it could prevent um, a, an actual um, a gaining of a foothold of the virus and prevent the individual uh, from being actually infected. And by the way, um, once they are and once symptoms develop, this is always going to be fatal. Okay, so let's talk about um, transmission of the disease. It's going to be transmitted through the uh, saliva, usually a bite, uh, the saliva of an infected animal. It's extremely unlikely that it would be transmitted through, um, let's say, inhalation or, um, or fomites, all right? So usually the bite of an infected animal. And in the United States, the very few cases that we may see um, in a year's period of time 
most of those infections are due to the bite of an infected bat. All right, so incubation, uh, it averages 30 to 50 days, but it could be as long as six years. Um, and what happens is, is once the individual is, um, is bitten, uh, the virus is going to travel along peripheral nerves until it reaches the central nervous system. Okay, now once it reaches the central nervous system, we are in uh, definite trouble. Um, once the central nervous system has been reached, encephalitis, brain infection is going to occur. And uh, the length of incubation is going to be largely dependent on uh, where the individual gets bitten. If they are bitten in nerve-rich areas like the hands or the face, the incubation period is going to be shorter. If they're bitten somewhere else, like in their behind, um, then incubation period is going to be longer. But think about it, you have um, um, an uh, aggressive, agitated animal lunging for you, okay? And what are you gonna do? Uh, well, you should, I guess, turn and run because if you get bitten, you're behind, it's gonna be a uh, longer incubation period. But probably what you're gonna do is put out your hands to, um, to fend it off, and so uh, bites in the hand are extremely likely. All righty, so um, we're going to see, um, as far as early symptoms go, we're going to see um, fever, headache, malaise, maybe a little bit of a fever. Now, often this is not diagnosed early because, first of all, it's so rare in the United States. And secondly, those symptoms, right? Wouldn't you agree? Uh, they could um, uh, indicate a number of different infections. So it could be mistaken. And um, as the disease progresses, we're going to see um, uh, agitation, alternating with calmness, um, uh, excitability, um, hypersalivation. Um, we're going to see, um, uh, they, they used to call this disease hydrophobia, right? And that's because of this symptom. When the infected individual either um, drinks water or inhales cold air, they will experience some um, violent and painful throat spasms after th this goes on for not very long because it isn't very long between uh, the beginning of symptoms and death. I'll, I'll address that again in a minute. Um, but uh, when they uh, even see water at this point, it can trigger those uh, throat spasms. Now, death usually occurs within days of the onset of symptoms. And once we've reached this point, there's absolutely nothing that we can do. This is going to be a fatal disease. Um, there are, um, or I should say, death is due to damage to the brain and other um, cells of the nervous system. Two forms of the disease, uh, one is called furious rabies, and that's uh, a situation where the infected individual um, is highly excitable and very aggressive, and that's the stuff that they make movies out of, right? Um, uh, Old Yeller and uh, Cujo, uh, to name a couple. Maybe those are the only ones I don't know. And then paralytic rabies is a situation where uh, the infected individual is not particularly aggressive and they may have um, partial or complete paralysis until uh, they lapse into a coma and die. Okay, a bit depressing. Um, now, there are some individuals, humans, that should be vaccinated for rabies. People in high-risk situations like veterinarians and um, maybe animal handlers, um, ranchers, I'm sure there are some other scenarios where uh, humans should be vaccinated against rabies. All right, we can talk more about this in class. It's a, a very interesting topic. Okay, and then uh, let's talk just a little bit about the retroviridae because we will have discussed HIV in quite a bit of detail uh, together in class, but I just wanted to go ahead and include it in the outline um, for your lecture exam. And uh, in the retroviridae family, we have, of course, um, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, and it, can, uh, it does cause a disease known as AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Now, this virus uh, preferentially infects a type of white blood cell called a Th um, or T4 or CD4 cell. I just like to call them helper T cells. It's a, it's a pretty simple way. There are other cell types that HIV can infect, but that's its favorite. 
Uh, now, these helper T cells, we haven't talked about immunology yet, but we will be shortly, but they play a role in um, the antibody production process. Now, I don't mean to suggest that these T cells themselves actually produce antibodies, but they play, let's say, an assisting role um, in the uh, antibody production process. Uh, one of their jobs, their main job, is called antigen presentation, meaning that these helper T cells actually are going to um, grasp a hold of antigen and deliver it to B cells so the B cells can be stimulated to develop into plasma cells and produce antibody molecules. But what happens is, is as the infection progresses, we're going to see a decline in the population of these helper T cells, which will be accompanied by a decline in the patient's immunity and their ability to fight um, what would normally be um, not significant infections, also more susceptible to other cancers. But we've seen many, many changes uh, in the treatment of the disease AIDS these days. And now I'm happy to say, uh, this is 2015 as I record this, that uh, there are cocktails of drugs, drug regimens that an HIV positive individual can take. And if they do so, um, they may be able to live um, out a natural lifespan. So uh, while we don't have a vaccine to prevent uh, infection with HIV and we don't have drugs yet to cure HIV, uh, we do have drugs that allow us to prolong the lifespan of the infected individual and give them a higher quality of life than um, even 10 years ago. All right, uh, some of the opportunistic infections, or I should say one of the opportunistic infections that we uh, commonly see when individuals progress to AIDS is one caused um, by uh, pneumocystis carini, and it causes a disease known as uh, PCP, pneumocystis carini pneumonia. We'll talk about that together in class. Uh, let's see, you've got some notes. Um, I'm thinking that we'll talk about those together and um, about treatment and transmission, transplacental um, transmission. So I'm gonna save that for a live discussion with you guys. Um, also in this group, just as a, a kind of a little footnote, are um, uh, the RNA tumor viruses cause a variety of tumors in, um, in animals. All right, I think this is gonna be a short segment, but I'm gonna go ahead and end here. And when I come back for segment nine, which will be the last one, I seriously hope uh, that will wrap up the section on the viruses. Thanks for watching, you guys.